When we're simplifying radical expressions, there are a couple of things we want to keep in mind. One is we want one radical if possible. So as an example of when we would not have one radical, something like the square root of 2 times the square root of 3 is not as simple as possible because there are two radicals running about. Uh, when would this not be possible? Well, as an example, the square root of 2 plus the square root of 3, these are not like terms. There is no way to add these two things together. So this is simple. This is okay. Whereas this can actually be rewritten using our multiplication rule as the square root of 6, which is the simple version. So this by itself was not simplified. So if it's possible, we want one radical. What else do we want in our simplified radical expressions? Well, two kind of funky rules. We want no fractions inside of ra radicals. And, this is two sides of the same coin, that's a terrible and symbol, and no radicals in denominators. And as I've said in class, this is based on some antiquated crap where back in the day you had to use a table to evaluate radicals. So uh, those of us new to radicals with technology still have to do this. Um, for whatever reason. Um, but it is good practice because being able to rewrite things in different forms is really important if you go into higher math. But uh, what does this mean? So what are our bad examples here? We could not have the square root of, I don't know, 5 over 4. This is not okay. It would be okay for us to use the division rule, the quotient rule, to divide this up into two radicals and then realize, okay, I do know the square root of 4 is 2 this is a completely okay radical whereas the other versions here were not simple enough this one had an this one has two radical symbols and one of them is a perfect square which is the last rule and this one has our fraction inside another example would be something like two divided by the square root of three which is what we've seen before in class uh, this is one where we, we would need to rationalize our denominator if we multiply by our ugly version of 1, square root of 3 over the square root of 3. This will become 2 root 3 all over the square root of 9 based on our multiplication rule, right? Our product rule, which is 2 root 3 over 3. This is now completely okay and allowed because we have one single radical and we don't have a radical in the denominator, but this would have been a problem. So our last rule for radicals, and that's what this video is going to focus on in terms of making them simplified, is that there are no perfect n powers uh, as factors in the radicand. So in Math 92, we focus mostly on square roots, so I'll start with that example just to give us one. So the square root of, let's say, 8 is a good example. Uh, this is, I should have written it in red because these are the bad ones, right? Mm -hmm. So the square root of 8 is not simplified because if you break down this radicand, this is the same thing as the square root of 4 times 2. And the square root of 4, or 4, is a perfect square root. And we're talking about nth roots. So when we talk about n powers, this is second powers. These are no perfect squares for this example. So in our class we're pretty much thinking mostly is this. So since 4 is in there and 4 is a perfect square, this is not as simple as it can be. And this is when we should use the multiplication rule or product rule in reverse and break this up into the square root of 4 times the square root of 2, which is 2 times the square root of 2. Now this is a simple and perfect answer. So we're going to focus in this video, like I said, we're just going to do a handful of examples on working with this rule, no perfect nth powers as, I should have had nth in here, nth powers as factors in our radicand. So 
we've done this a lot in class and we've seen other ways to do it. I'm going to do one example where I work us through the factor tree version, discussing how it's the same as what I did before, and then we will, I'll give you a couple to try on your own. So let me just come up with a number, because this is a good idea. Uh, oh well, so we'll do something gross. Let's do the square root of 520. I have no idea what this simplifies to. If I don't immediately see a way this breaks down, this looks like it might be to a of 4, but if I don't see a way it breaks down, I can get in trouble by just saying, oh, 4 is a perfect root. I can even, I can double check it in my calculator. I bust out a calculator and go, okay, well, let me divide 520 by 4. Sure enough, 4 times 130 is a, this is equal to square root of 4 times 130. So right now we can already see there's a 4 in there. There might be something better than 4. I don't know. So one of the ways that you can check to make sure you're actually taking out the biggest possible perfect square, or all of the perfect squares, is to do a factor tree. So this is what we did in class. Since 520 ends with a 10, I'm actually going to use 52 and 10 as my way to split this up. Uh, 52 breaks down into 4 and 13. 10 breaks down into 5 and 2. And then 4 breaks down into 2 and 2. So what this factor tree tells me is that I can rewrite the square root of 520 as, uh, let me put them into, so they're smallest to largest. 2 times 2 times 2 times 5 times 13. And I can double check this by just plugging all those numbers into my calculator, right? So I've just rewritten 52 by grabbing all of these prime factors is what we end up with from our factor tree. All of those ends are the prime factors. Now our goal when we're thinking about a square root is to find any perfect pairs because pairs are perfect squares. So now if we rewrote this, we could take a moment and actually rewrite this square root as the square root of 4 times whatever the crap this stuff is multiplied together, 130, like I had originally. And then we could use our product rule to break this up. So this is just 2 root 130. Now this is why in class when we did this, we sort of, we, we cut a lot of shortcuts on this and we mostly didn't take the time to rewrite, oops, I didn't mean to get rid of my 5, we didn't take the time to do this step and rewrite the whole thing. We just did our work from within the tree. So we would say, okay, look, these twos pair up. So two can come outside because it's a perfect square, right? So if we take the square root of a perfect square, it'll just leave us with the two. And then all of this crap that didn't pair up, well, it ends up on the outside or on the inside. So that's all gonna stay inside, multiply it all together to get 130. But you can see moving through these steps, I'm never sort of taking anything for granted or like doing something I just have memorized. Instead, I can actually see each of the bits and pieces and never am I doing something I don't feel comfortable with or I don't fully understand what I'm doing. Um, and if you want to check these in your calculator, remember your option is to type both this and the original into your calculator and make sure they give you the same decimal approximation. So if I do square root of 520 in my calculator, it tells me that this is 22.8035, and they should both make the same exact approximation. If they don't, I have done something wrong. I'm going to do one more with you guys as an example. This time, I'm going to up it a little bit. I'm going to have us do the square root of 50. Oh, not the square root. Let's do a cube root. Let's make it something harder. Of 54, x to the 6th y to the seventh. So now we're throwing variables into the mix, which I think actually makes things easier, especially if you go through that step we did before. So again, if we want to see how 54 breaks down, and we don't know all our perfect cubes and all that, we can see, okay, two goes into it with 27, which is three times nine, and then this is three and three. Now remember, since we have an index of three out here, we want to look for perfect cubes, not perfect squares. So as we break this thing up, and I'm going to go ahead and do this in a big ass multiplication inside the radicand, 54 can be written rewritten as 2 times 3 times 3 times 3. If we really want to, we can go ahead and rewrite x to the 6th power as a bunch of x's all multiplied together, 6 of them exactly. And then we need 7 y's. And this is why you're like, okay, 
please tell me there's a faster way than me doing this in my paper. There is. We will go over it. And now, remember, this is all a cube root. We're looking for groups of three are perfect cubes. So you can see we have one group of cubes here. One, our one group of three is a group of X's, a group of X's, a group of Y's, a group of Y's, and we can see exactly who's left out. So if I wanted to, I could even take that step that we did on the last problem. This is 2 times 3 cubed, times x cubed, times x cubed, times y cubed, times y cubed. And then I could break this down. This is the cube root of 2, times the cube root of 3 cubed, times the cube root of x cubed, right? We don't need to do all of this work, but hopefully this insanely difficult illustration, oh, I forgot a y, oops, shows you that this is why we bring these things to the outside, right? When we see those groups of three, we can do it here, we can do it there. Each of these is going to be a perfect cube, so we can actually evaluate it and ignore the cube root as it is. And then we've got a y and a y. And still inside the cube root, we're left with a 2 and a y. And we can clean this up to our final answer, 3x squared, y squared, times the cube root of 2y. As we discussed in class, you don't need to do all of this work. What we're essentially doing is grouping like you did in division when you were a kid. So you can actually say how many times, at least for the things that we have powers for, how many groups of 3 can I get out of my 6x's? Two of them with nothing left over. How many groups of three can I get out of my seven Y's? Two of them with one left over. So here's my two groups that came out and my one left over. All right, so I don't know if I'll make another video with examples. I had said I would. Uh, we'll see if I have time, but for now, you at least have a video sort of running down, simplifying, and why it is we do this crap where we say, oh, three's gonna go outside and two's gonna go inside instead of memorizing some rule about a house party or the Berlin Wall or whatever that might be.